Good morning, folks. Welcome to That's My Farm. I'm Jim Schroyer, your host. And today we're in Riley County. We're at Ashland Bottoms at the Agronomy Farm just south of Manhattan. And we're going to be talking with Dr. Deanne Presley, our soil management specialist here at K-State. And she's going to be telling us about things we should be thinking about cover crops. Cover crops have really taken off this past decade and there's lots of interest. So come on back after these words from our sponsors and we'll talk to Deanne about cover crops. See you then. Closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com. That's My Farm is brought to you in part by Tall Grass Commodities. Big enough to serve, small enough to care. Good morning, folks. Welcome to That's My Farm. I'm Jim Schroyer, your host, and we're in luck today because we're in Riley County. We're at the agronomy farm at Ashland Bottoms, and with us we have Dr. Deanne Presley, our soil management specialist, and, and uh, we're going to be talking about cover crops today. And Deanne, so the first question is, why cover crops? What's, what's the deal with cover crops? Sure. So I get that question a lot. Is it a new thing? And the answer is no, nope. not at all. Mm -hmm. People have been doing cover crops for probably thousands of years, but in the U.S. we've been doing cover crops since we've been farming. Thomas Jefferson, mm -hmm. George Washington, they were fans of cover crops. So cover crop is simply a soil that's, uh, a crop that's planted to improve the soil usually. So planted commonly to either stop erosion or put nutrients or organic matter back into the soil. So the easiest way to explain it is a crop that's planted that we're not gonna use for anything. The cash crop is when we harvest for grain, a forage crop is eaten by an animal, but a cover crop is normally referred to as a crop that's just used to improve soil or keep soil from leaving. Okay, so yeah, that would be one of the things I always thought about cover crops, not so much the not so much the nutrient gain from it, but just having that ground covered so there wouldn't be erosion. But you know, if you had a legume in the in the cover crop mix, mm -hmm. you know, then you've got some uh, added nitrogen there but as well. But also that organic matter, building organic matter up. On average, on most of our cropland, over half the organic matter is gone from where it started. So if you compare any crop field, you, you're talking historically since mm -hmm. since we started agriculture tillage that. Yes. Uh, that's what, okay. Right. Yeah, so if you would compare a pasture mm -hmm. that's never been tilled with cropland, usually there's only about half as much organic matter. Exactly. And so, you know, some the of The oxidation because, with tillage, the oxidation mm -hmm. of the organic matter. That right. and erosion to the best soil down to the bottom of the hill or into our creeks and streams. And so organic matter is what gives soils its nutrient holding capacity, it mm -hmm. really enhances it. And the water holding capacity and also improves the soil physical property. So it's easier to plant into a soil with better organic matter and soils with more organic matter take water a little better so not just the nitrogen but also building up organic matter that's one of the purposes of cover crops well now you know with the advent of uh, strip tillage or no-till yep. uh, I see cover crops being advantaged but if you work the ground then we're back to where we almost to where we started from of losing organic matter and that sort of thing I well, see you don't even, agree. To, well, I don't see you agree it totally, but I'm seeing with yes. no-till, I see cover crops working well. Well, I just say with no-till, we build back soil organic matter too. So if a farmer is doing a diverse crop rotation and no-tilling, they're putting organic matter back into the soil just that way. And if they take cover crops and add it, that takes it even more faster. But back to the whole thing with tillage and cover crops. So truly, if a cover crop is if a crop is grown, like a legume cover crop is grown and then turned into the soil. So here behind us, you can see we're in a no-till situation, but if it were to be turned in, you can see some tillage in the background. That's referred to as more of a green manure. Mm -hmm. Still, that's good for soils if a farmer is going to choose to do tillage. I'd rather see them do that than not do that. Right, <laughs> so right. building soil, giving back. Okay. Deanne, stay with us. we got to take a break right here. You folks at home, now's your chance to get a cup of coffee, and we'll be back after these words from our sponsors. Soil is the life of a farm, and for 25 years, SureCrop Liquid Crop Nutrition has helped growers produce abundant quality crops while preserving and improving the soils they steward. SureCrop offers complete soil and plant analysis with cropping recommendations, delivery direct to your on-farm storage, and quality crop nutrition custom blended for your field. Choose SureCrop for the assurance of excellence for your soil. Call today or visit their website for more information. 
Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. Ag Promo Source is a unique group of marketing specialists with one mission, help your ag business grow. Each affiliate has their own area of expertise and they work together to bring you advice, products, and services. To get started, visit agpromosource.com. Ag Promo Source, together we grow. That's My Farm is brought to you in part by Tall Grass Commodities, big enough to serve, small enough to care. Welcome back to That's My Farm. I'm Jim Schroyer, your host, and we have Deanne Presley with us, our soil management specialist. And Deanne, we talked a little bit, uh, the introduction of cover crops there, the first segment. Now let's talk about some of the, uh, the types of cover crops. Sure. So when people ask me about cover crops, I kind of, in my mind, I have to categorize them a little right. bit. So there's cover crops you can grow that are more in the summer, right after wheat. Summer cover crops. Mm -hmm. Or you can grow them or more in the winter. So try to plant them after corn or soybeans, which is tricky, but it can be done. Mm -hmm. So there's that, winter versus summer. And okay. then there's legume versus non-legume. Okay. So, Within each of those groups, I suppose. Yeah. yeah, so there's legumes we can grow in the summer, such as sun hemp or cowpeas. Those mm -hmm. work great. Um, and then there's legumes we can grow in the fall, like a vetch or a winter pea or something like that. So. Whenever somebody says, hey, let's talk about what I can plant, and I say, whoop, whoop, let's first start talking about two things. When do you want to plant them? At between what crop and what other crop? And also, what are you going to do with it? What's your goal? Is something going to eat this? So I said in the first little part there, I said a cover crop is something that's not eaten. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is, in practicality, most Kansas farmers are, are pretty practical, and they're thinking, well, what could I grow that a cow could eat? Right. Usually cattle, right? So what could I grow that a cow could eat? So right. I don't actually draw that distinction and say, I'm not going to talk about forages. We have meetings all the time. We do research in which we evaluate how much biomass is produced sure. and the quality of that biomass. So even though I say strictly as a cover, really, I don't mean it. I'm not serious. I will we'll evaluate for forage, too. So we think about it all. Yeah, you're right. The, the farmers, uh, when they see, you know, uh, foot and a half of forage out there of some type, whether the legume or, or non-legume, they're thinking, oh, okay, I, my cows can, or goats or sheep or whatever can, can eat that. Right, and so that affects really their selection that they make from the beginning. So if it's something's going to eat it, mm -hmm. they're probably going to look at that and say, what things could I select that are high biomass producing in a short window of time? But then, of course, there's the quality issues, like, well, do those accumulate nitrogen and thinking about it that way. So there's just a ton of extension work and research work that we're doing right now to, to really gauge that so that we can do some of the experimentation before farmers have to on their own farms. Although the on-farm experimentation that's happening is critical, too. So we didn't really mention brassicas earlier, but plants in the Brassicaceae family, those are, of course, non-legumes. But that's one of the types of plants that we have a lot growing. Um, and we're talking about the brassicas, we're talking about canola or mm -hmm. rapeseed, uh, uh, radishes and turnips, basically. Uh, yeah, those are some of them. And then there's actually these hybrid crosses that have been made. So forage, um, forage radishes, for example. Right. So some of those, what's nice about them is that if an animal to, were to swipe off that top, many of them, the growing, it'll still grow, regrow from that growing point. Mm -hmm. Some plants won't, but the forage ones that have been bred for that will regrow and so then they produce more biomass. Just kind of like salad greens, they regrow. So again, whether somebody picks a tillage radish or they pick a forage radish, depends on what their intended use is. Right, exactly. Stay with us, we gotta take a break. Folks, stay with us. We'll be right back after these words. This segment brought to you by the Arab Shrine Circus, coming to the Kansas Expo Center February 15th through the 18th. For ticket information, visit ArabShrineCircus.com. Tarwater Farm and Home has been family owned and operated since its beginning in 1978. What you need for farm and agriculture, lawn and garden, clothing and footwear, and so much more. You'll be surprised at what you'll find in this huge store. They have what you need and lots of it. So come take a look. You'll discover that customer service is first and foremost. Always has been with the Tarwaters. Tarwater Farm and Home, 4107 North Topeka Boulevard. You don't have to be a farmer or rancher to become a Kansas Farm Bureau member. Anyone can join. 
As a member, you'll get discounts on things like hotels and entertainment, health and wellness services, cell phone plans, and more. You'll also strengthen the lives of your fellow Kansans and help build strong, prosperous communities through agriculture advocacy and education. Join us today. Visit kfb.org slash join to learn more. That's My Farm is brought to you in part by Tall Grass Commodities. Big enough to serve, small enough to care. Welcome back to That's My Farm. I'm Jim Schroyer. And with us, we have Deanne Presley, our soil management specialist. And we're on the agronomy farm at Ashland Bottom, south of Manhattan. And uh, Deanne, you alluded to research a while ago about uh, cover crops and kind of tell us where we're standing right now. Okay, first this experiment, this is a project initiated by Craig Roseboom back in 2007 and it's been going on ever since. And so what we have here is if it's in this line kind of north to south, but there's a wheat, sorghum and soybean rotation. And so, but after the wheat is when the cover crop is in the experiment. There's, it's not after the sorghum or after the soybean, just after the wheat. And so half of those cover crops, so half of the different treatments are summer crops. So for example, this dead residue right here is sorghum Sudan grass. Mm -hmm. um, and this one that I'm standing in right now, um, if you can see kind of this darker gray, um, this was a beautiful stand of crimson clover, just gorgeous red flowers, pinkish red flowers um, that were growing here. So after, yeah. Yeah, after the wheat, so uh, see yeah, a little wheat volunteer stubble. wheat here. Yep, that, that's going to be dead here soon. And then we'll be planting sorghum here in probably, what, a month or so, right? So, but anyway, so, you know, different purpose. They have a legume here. This one was a, um, you know, a forage, forage type experiment. And so then there's measurements of all kinds being taken out here. So Craig has different nitrogen rates to examine the benefits. So the benefits here of a legume. Right. I think the nitrogen contribution of this cut crimson clover will probably be somewhere between 30, 40, 50 pounds. Right. The subsequent crop, so it's an excellent crop for that. Obviously, the longer it goes before it's terminated, the more nitrogen yes. it'll fix. Yes. And this year, we planted it and did everything right. We were living right. We got plenty of growth off of it this time. So this, you know, you might think, oh, it doesn't look like much. For crimson clover it is. Crimson clover is about the roots. Mm -hmm. So beautiful, as a soil scientist, beautiful root system. But the sorghum sedan grass, the purpose of that is to grow above ground biomass right. for an animal to consume. And so, so that's what the kind of research is, is the not only the performance of the cover crops, the performance of the subsequent cash crops. Right. We have to figure out a way to monetize and pay for these cover crops. Finally, if you see that trailer in the background, that's a researcher named Peter Tomlinson who's doing work with greenhouse gases. So how does having a cover crop living and growing change what greenhouse gases are given off from the soil versus a soil that has no cover crop? So if they're consuming- More exposed, are you saying? Yeah, the different exposure of soil. So we have a bare soil over mm -hmm. there. What's mm -hmm. happening? First of all, what's happening to the carbon, but what's happening to any of the nitrogen left over in that system from the previous crop? Denitrification, oh sorry, well, denitrification, leaching if the soil type is right, versus here where something is green and growing, it'll utilize it. Right. Sorghum sedan grass would do an excellent job utilizing that, and then perhaps releasing it back through the soil to the next subsequent crop, and maybe ending up with less greenhouse gas emissions. So, and that's his work that he's doing there. Okay, so, so you got a couple, three studies here. And, and don't forget about the soil quality. That's where I come in. Right. We measure how well the soils, if they're changing. Okay, hang on. I want to continue the research aspect here in a second, but we have to take a break. Folks, stay with us. We'll be right back after these words from our sponsors. Ladies and gentlemen, girls and boys, it's Shrine Circus time. Enjoy a weekend of thrills, chills, and tons of fun at the Kansas Expo Center February 15th, 16th, 17th, and 18th. See lions and tigers, elephants, high-flying trapeze artists, and watch a man shot out of a cannon. And Johnny Rocket, everyone's favorite, is back. For more information, visit ArabShrineCircus.com and be sure to thank our corporate sponsor, Security Benefit. The Arab Shrine Circus, don't you dare miss it. I had this horse, it was a good horse, except when the wind was blowing above 30 mile an hour. Wind was blowing about 35, 40, and I saddled him up, rode him out to the end of the lane, and I thought, well, he's doing pretty good. And about six jumps later, I was laying on the ground, and 
thinking, boy, my shoulder sure hurt. I kept waiting and it, it didn't get better. And so I went to an orthopedic surgeon and that showed that I had torn rotator cuff. And said, well, I have to do surgery. And I, I farm and ranch by myself. It's not gonna work out very well. I'd been sleeping in my recliner for about two and a half years because it hurt too much to sleep in bed on my side. And I'd heard about Kansas Regenerative Medicine Center on the radio. And gotten down there at eight o'clock in the morning and by 11.30, the procedure was all over. They just took some fat out of my side here and spun that down for about 45 minutes and then injected it in my shoulders and I was on my way. It's something you don't hear about, but I thought it was worth a try and, and I'm really pleased. It's, it's really worked out well for me. That's My Farm is brought to you in part by Tall Grass Commodities. Big enough to serve, small enough to care. Welcome back, folks, to That's My Farm. I'm Jim Schroyer. Deanne Presley is still with us. She didn't run off during the break. <laughs> so, Deanne, we talked a little bit about the research a while ago. And let's continue research in other parts of the state. Sure. So, we have a huge rainfall change across our state right exactly. so let's let's start dry first so john holman is a researcher who's been doing cover crop work since 2006 at garden city mm -hmm. he's got an experiment involving two different experiments actually one that involves putting a cover crop in a wheat rotation so wheat cover crop wheat or right. wheat fallow wheat or continuous wheat that's the kind of thing he does mm -hmm. and looking at the effects of the cover crop on the subsequent wheat crop but also on the value of that cover crop as a forage and right. so just to summarize his work is depends if it's a good rainfall year or bad rainfall year if it's a bad rainfall year those cover crops they use up moisture and they don't produce much either true they don't produce a ton either ton literally ton but i mean it, it depends on the crop because he's got 15 different covers that he's evaluating so some are you know low biomass producers like lentils they don't produce much and he's got right. others like triticale that produce a lot so in those years it really depends what you grow and then in the high rainfall years they really don't affect the subsequent yields very much and when you grow a whole bunch of triticale and feed that to something that's actually quite positive for income so right. you have to look at that work and think about what's your objective what do you want to do to make a conclusion? And then if we move, uh, so I think what's Garden City? About 16, 18, 20 inches of rain, yeah, depending. 16, 18, yeah, 16, <laughs> Highly 18. variable. So then if you move, um, Craig Rosenboom, I said, he also has another experiment in central Kansas, so Belleville. And I'm not sure the rainfall on that, 22-ish, 24-ish, mm -hmm, maybe mm -hmm. something like that. So he's got an experiment um, also after wheat with cover crops. And there's a grad student, her name is Maddie Kirkendall, and she's measuring the water use by those cover crops. So very detailed work. It's fascinating. They're finding after wheat, plant a cover crop, you'll get water extraction down eight or nine feet from a radish by the time that radish dies. We've got some radishes behind us, but by the time those radishes die, because they're not winter hardy at all, by the time they die, they've used water down eight or nine feet. Fascinating. And that difference in that water, you could they've been seeing that through the subsequent crop, uh -huh. which I think they've been growing corn. Um, and so, again, is that positive? Is that negative? Well, again, if it's just truly a cover, you might, you'd have to look at those results with your intended purpose in mind. So, now, let's shift entirely somewhere different. Parsons, Kansas. Actually, Southeast. Yeah, mm -hmm. Columbus, Kansas is where we've got uh, Gretchen Sassenrath and Jamie Lynn Farney are the researchers there. And they're measuring what get, what happens if we plant a cover crop, you actually using it for forage, because Jamie Lynn's an animal scientist. But and they're they're doing mixtures work. Uh -huh. So this idea of what if you mix three things together, maybe you get some kind of kind of some synergy. So in, they always have a grass, so cereal, so uh, barley and oats and maybe wheat is one of the other ones. They always have a breast casea, so oh, it's a, that one's a radish or a turnip. And then they have a legume. So that one's, uh, oh, bursine clover. That has okay, not grown sure. at all. But then there's some other one, I think peas. And then my grad student helps in clips. So she'll clip out a known area quantifying the biomass at 30, 60, and 90 days. So 30 days, we were sticking that in gallon trash gallon Ziplocs. Uh -huh. By 60 days, we had trash bags, okay. big trash bags. So oh, 60 oh. days was a good amount of time for some forage growth there. Okay. We got to take another break, so hang on. Don't run away. <laughs> Folks, don't run away either. We'll be right back after these words.
The Kansas Wheat Innovation Center in Manhattan is rediscovering ways to get improved varieties and new genetics in the hands of farmers faster. Grower-led and checkoff-funded research initiatives are bringing about positive change. This grassroots leadership provides a strong voice in Topeka and Washington, D.C. Now is the time to partner with Kansas Wheat in moving wheat forward. Kansas Wheat Commission and Kansas Association of Wheat Growers, farmers investing in their future and yours. Log on to rediscoverwheat.org. We do business with Blueville because of the quality of their work it is excellent quality and because they make a commitment to their customers. We enjoy the benefits of hiring a good company to help us maintain this home. We will always do business with Blueville. We have for many, many years and there's no reason for us to look for any other service. Next time you see a beautiful field of corn, reach out and thank the farmers who work tirelessly to raise corn for livestock feed, renewable fuels, and exports to feed a growing world population. The farmers on the Kansas Corn Commission work for Kansas Corn with grower-funded checkoff dollars that support foreign and domestic market development, research, promotion, and education to expand opportunities for Kansas farmers. To learn more, visit kscorn.com. That's My Farm is brought to you in part by Tall Grass Commodities. Big enough to serve, small enough to care. Welcome back to That's My Farm. I'm Jim Schroyer. And in this last segment with Deanne, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about mixed crops and some other things. But uh, let's go ahead and continue the, the thought process of one, two or three or a half a dozen or a mm -hmm. dozen uh, cover crops mixtures. Sure, farmers are very interested in mixtures and there's some good reasons for that. We have we have mixtures in a few of our experiments. John has one, Craig has one, so uh, we have mixtures. So people are combining all sorts of things and the reason they're doing that is to gain some multiple benefits. So if you think about a crop that's got some short fibrous roots and think about big old tap roots on something like a radish, which like I said, they're extracting water down to eight or nine feet. So they're getting good stuff down from eight or nine feet and bringing it up, such mm -hmm. as maybe some nitrate that's moved down or maybe other nutrients that have become a little more depleted. So in the you're surface. recycling basically. So recycling of nutrients, but what else? Big roots, little fine roots, they enhance soil a lot. And so this equipment behind me, this is some of the stuff I do to quantify soil health. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about soil health, we're talking about the physical and the chemical and the biological properties. Now I like to measure the physical. So we pound these rims into the ground, about three inches, fill it up with water and measure how fast the water moves into the soil. We've been doing that for the past couple of weeks. So we measure it dry and then we measure it wet again. Mm -hmm. And so those are just some of the things that maybe it's hard to monetize, quantify the benefit to a individual farmer from getting water in the soil faster. But Boy, if they can get in there and plant a day or two earlier mm -hmm. than if they hadn't, that's exactly. kind of, you know, getting planting done in a timely fashion. Or if water goes in rather than running off from an environmental standpoint, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Prevent some regulatory agencies from, from you know, stopping, stopping what we want to do, I guess. And where can people get information about... Sure. Cover crops. I want to show a pub that this is from K-State and in here and that's a, a chapter in here on cover crops and it's got a table that talks about all the different uses of cover crops and then several different cover crops. This is available from any extension office uh, in the state. What about this one? This one's called Managing Cover Crops Profitably, third edition. And if you want to know anything about any individual cover crop, it's probably in here. So something on annual ryegrass. We're trying to figure out what's the difference between annual ryegrass and cereal rye. That's in there and it'll tell Big you difference. when to seed it, exactly, when to seed it, how to seed it, seeding rates, when to use one and not the other. So that's a great reference and that's actually online for free from an organization called SARE, Sustainable Ag Research and Education. So. Okay. Deanna, I really appreciate you taking time and talk to us about cover crops. I think it'd be kind of fun to come back you know, when they're, some of them are growing and take a look at, at them and some of the, some of the actual d data that we've, uh, you've uh, come up with. Well, I have to say that I'm glad we did this here in 2015 because you know 2015 is the International Year of Soils. International. UN proclaimed it so, the United Nations. So as a soil scientist, we're pretty excited about that. It brings some recognition to soils. There you go. And its importance around the world. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Folks, thank you for being with us on this issue of That's My Farm. And don't forget, next week at this same time, we'll have another session of That's My Farm. So see you then. 
closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com.